but were on a bit of a mission today to find an abandoned old armament factory hidden on the banks of the River Tyne in Newcastle. I found it once while shooting some content for Tyne and Weir Museums in the depth of winter, but I wanted to explore it properly this time and show you how to get to it. Starting on the elegant Grey Street, we start to head down to the quayside. Described by Prime Minister Gladstone as the country's best modern street, Grey Street curves beautifully in a classical style that contrasts with the medieval architecture of the riverside. Nicknamed Granger Town, this area of Newcastle is thanks to Richard Granger the son of a quayside porter and his partnership with John Dobson. In 1834, Granger submitted new plans for new streets to be built. Grey Street was initially earmarked to be called Upper Dean Street. The name Grey Street was eventually settled on, inspired by the Northumbrian-born Prime Minister Earl Grey, that also looks out over the city centre from his monument. As we approach this junction, did you know that Morsley Street was the first street to be lit with electricity in the whole world? On the 3rd of February 1879, Joseph Swan's invention revolutionised the way for the modern lighting that we take for granted today. While so beautiful and picturesque, the street does give you a false sense of security when you walk down it to the quayside. You soon find the error of your ways when you need to walk back up again, as it's the most steep street to climb up ever. A lot of Newcastle city centre looks very much the same as old photographs, and there's even more hints to the past with old street names, such as Painter Hugh, and also the dog leap stairs that we can see just next to the railway bridge. Before we head down the quayside, I really want to show you a historic gem on the other side of the Tyne Bridge that links to Newcastle's Edwardian past. This Tyne Tea Steamship and Company sign sits on the corner of King Street, advertising passenger and cargo routes from a bygone leisure era. Between 1904 and 1943, this is where people could book tickets aboard one of 10 steamerships, heading to exotic destinations like Amsterdam, Hamburg and North French ports. The sign looks very different to when I last saw it earlier on in the year, so I think the present sign is a replacement to preserve the original wooden sign. Crossing the road, we're greeted with the magnificent sight of the many bridges that Newcastle is so famous for. We're going to continue down this path along the quayside, to the abandoned old armament factory. According to Google Maps, the walk is about 2 miles in length and takes 40 minutes to get to the Newcastle Business Park, which is where the factory was situated. The swing bridge in front of us is a feat of Victorian engineering and was actually designed and constructed by Sir W. G. Armstrong Company Limited of Elswick, which was in the area that we're heading to. The 
The Swing Bridge was the fourth bridge to be built on the same site over the River Tyne in Newcastle, with the first being constructed from wood and stone in circa 120 AD by the Emperor here. The third bridge was built in the Georgian period and had a lower level that prevented larger vessels from moving up the river towards the industrial factories. Cales had to transport coal from the riverside states to the ships further down river and it really hindered the Armstrong factories in Elswick as a result. Work began on the bridge in 1868 with Armstrong and Co of Elswick supplying and installing the ironwork and machinery. At the time of construction it was the largest swing bridge ever built, costing £240,000 in old money. Opened in 1876, the bridge was first used for road traffic before being opened for river traffic a month later. The first swing was made for the Italian naval vessel Europa, who was on its way to the Elzig Works on the 17th of July 1876. On the gateshead side of the bridge is an old river police station that would have guarded the river for Newcastle and Gateshead. There's even a little central jetty connected to the swing bridge where the River Tyne police would tie up small boats. Incredible power from two steam driven hydraulic engines helped to revoke the 3,000 tonne swinging part of the bridge, allowing ships to pass on each side. Trade boomed following the opening of the swing bridge, with the Armstrong Elswick shipyard commenced in 1884, as well as easier shipment of coal and goods shipments being able to be taken further down the river. As well as coal, fish was a boom in trade in Newcastle. This covered in fish market was built in 1880, replacing the one within the Guildhall designed by John Dobson. William Gray said in 1649, Sand Hill, a market for fish and other commodities. Very convenient for merchant adventurers, merchants of coals, and all that have their living by shipping. Underneath the high level bridge is a blue plaque that I've never seen before for a Henry Harry Clasper. Henry was a world champion rower and pioneer and boat builder who competed in over 130 races, many of them which were on the River Tyne, from this bridge to the Scotswood Bridge. Thankfully we're not as going as far as the Scotswood Bridge. Ahead of us are the King Edward VII, Queen Elizabeth II Metro and the Red Hue Bridges. Did you know that the King Edward VII bridge has been described as Britain's last great railway bridge? Can I say bridge any more times? Bridges, bridges, bridges. During the Victorian period, traffic over the high level bridge had expanded greatly, meaning that a second railway bridge was desperately needed. An elevated cable weight that ran across the river was used within the construction of the bridge, being the largest cable weight in the world at a length of 463.5 metres and being suspended 61 metres above the Tyne at high water. 
Following the completion of the bridge, the cable wasn't going to waste. It was transported over to the Swan Hunter and Wigan Richardson shipyard in Walls End, where it was reused in the launch of the ocean liner RMS Mauritania, which was the world's largest ship until 1910. Heading past the Red Hue Bridge, we're travelling further out of Newcastle City Centre, towards Scotswood and Elswick. In the distance on the Gateshead side of the Tyne is the Dunstan Staiths. The Dunstan Staiths were opened in 1893 by the North East Railway Company to allow large quantities of coal arriving by rail from the Down coal fields to be loaded directly onto the Wheaton Collier ships, ready for journeys to customers in London and beyond. The structure is thought to be the largest wooden structure in Europe, taking 3,000 tonnes of pitch pine to build the staiths. At the coal industry's peak, around 5.5 million tonnes of coal was moved this way each year. The staiths are 526 metres long, with four railway tracks, six loading berths alongside two chutes for each berth creating an immense amount of industrial activity on this section of the time. Coal wagons were pushed by steam engines up the gradient to the staiths, before a team of teamers and trimmers were waiting in the collier ships to level the coal as it came down the chutes to keep the ships level. The empty wagons would then roll back to the railway, sliding with gravity. Unfortunately, the Staiths are unable to be visited at the moment due to arson attacks, which caused major damage to the structure. We've now reached Newcastle Business Park, which looks incredibly different to how it did over a hundred years ago. Manufacturing dominated this section of the River Tyne, with the factories of Elswick Works and Scotswood Works for Victor's Armstrong, as well as all of its predecessor companies, took up an impressive mile where we're walking now. William Armstrong is a well-known figure in Newcastle with his influence for engineering and industrialism having shaped the way the city looks today. From the swing bridge that we walked past earlier to the high level bridge that I also made a video about, Armstrong's presence is definitely still felt on this side of the time. William Armstrong was all set on a career in law, when seeing a water wheel whilst fishing being the spark to create a difference. Armstrong's first invention was a rotary engine powered by water, saving power from being wasted. However, little interest was shown in the engine, so it was redeveloped into a piston design, and he thought it might be suitable for driving a hydraulic crane. In 1845, a scheme was set into motion to provide piped water from distant reservoirs to the houses of Newcastle, so Armstrong took his chance. He proposed to the Newcastle Corporation that the excess water pressure in the lower part of the town could be used to power a quayside crane, specially adapted by himself, claiming that the crane could unload ships faster and more cheaply than conventional cranes. The experiment proved so successful that more hydraulic cranes were installed on the quayside. Through the success of his crane, William Armstrong resigned from his legal law practice with his firm WG Armstrong & Company, buying five and a half acres of land along the River at Elswick to build a factory. 
Orders for the hydraulic cranes came from Edinburgh and Northern Railways, as well as the Liverpool docks. The company expanded into bridges, warships and armaments, with the Elzig works continuing to prosper. By 1870, the work stretched three quarters of a mile along the riverside, with the population of Elzik increasing from 3,539 in 1851 to 27,800 by 1871. It's hard to imagine now that this river would have been full of all different kinds of ships. A wealth of fighting ships were produced on this very spot for the entire world. A close bond was formed with the northeastern Japan as this is where much of the Japanese Navy ships were built. Admiral Toko even personally visited the shipyard after the ships gained great naval victories to see where his powerful Navy had been produced. Castle Business Park seems to go on forever and ever, but that's genuinely how big the Armstrong Works was on this side of the river. Once we see the pointed house-like buildings after all of the Armstrong signs, we're pretty much here. If you keep looking towards the right, you'll eventually see the great brick arches of the Elzik Ordnance Company coming into view beside the car park. How amazing is it that as part of one of the world's largest armament factories, hidden by a car park in the business park? I was absolutely amazed the first time I saw it. The surviving structure that we can see here formed part of the projectile shop within the works. This would have been where the Armstrong gun would have been made, alongside the shells and artillery to go with it. Even testing would have been done here, with shooting a torpedo or two across to Gateshead. It's crazy to think that all this began with the Armstrong gun, designed by William Armstrong in 1855, providing lighter weapons with better range and accuracy. The range of archers would have contained chutes and machinery, which allowed material to be passed from one level to another. The Elzig Ordnance Company was created in 1859 here to separate William Armstrong's armament business with his other business interests, to avoid conflict of interest with his position at the War Office. The company's main customer was actually the British government, however they abandoned the Armstrong guns in the 1860s due to not being happy with the breach mechanism. A set of stairs has been put into this part of the structure, but I couldn't resist having a walk up to see what else I could see. Did you know that this factory was the only one in the world to be able to build a warship from scratch, equipping it with everything? At this level, you can see an arched doorway, which is a bit gated off and also what looks to be Armstrong's crest at the top. Peering through the arched doorway, we can see different compartments of the original structure of this armament factory. 
perched high above the building is what looks to be Armstrong's crest. An arm raised with a hammer alongside what looks to be a warrior's head. I'm not too sure, but if you know anything about it, please let me know. I've absolutely loved taking you to this forgotten and abandoned armament factory. It's such an incredible piece of Northeast history that reminds us of the hard working people that worked here. As always, please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and I'll see you soon.